A plastic soda bottle begins with this tube called a preform, which is created by injection molding. The preform is heated enough to become flexible, but not hot enough to melt. Then a blast of air inflates the preform into a bottle. This isn't a very good looking bottle, but notice that the preform inflates into the cylindrical shape by design. Its walls are thin at the top, tapering to a thicker sides and bottom. To create a perfectly shaped bottle, you need to inflate the bottle in a mold like this. An intense blast of air creates the bottle in the blink of an eye. To see the steps, let's slow things down. In the mold, a rod enters the preform and a blast of air at about 100 pounds per square inch starts to inflate the preform. In a fraction of a second, the blast forms a bubble a third to a halfway down the preform just enough so that the bubble almost reaches the mold's wall. Next, as the stretching rod races to the bottom of the mold, a blast of air at 480 pounds per square inch transforms that bubble in two hundredths of a second into a fully formed bottle. Generating the air for this process is so significant that other than the cost of making the plastic preform, the energy to create the air is the largest cost. Of course, this inflation of a preform is a quick way to make a bottle, always something desired in manufacturing, but it does more than that. Stretching the plastic is central to the masterful engineering of the plastic soda bottle. The stretching imparts to the bottle its strength. And that's surprising because the bottle feels flimsy, especially if we compare it to its predecessor, the mighty glass bottle from the early 1970s. It weighs nearly 1,500 grams compared to a mere 42 grams for the plastic bottle. Yet, engineers designed the plastic bottle to be strong enough. They designed a soda-filled bottle to drop from two meters onto a concrete floor and neither burst nor deform, so that after this drop, the bottle would be able to stand upright. Part of that strength comes from inflating the preform, because that creates a bottle without seams, which would burst open if the bottle were dropped. Also, the bottle must be strong enough so the pressure of the carbon dioxide in the soda doesn't distort the bottle. Recall that in the bottle, gaseous carbon dioxide is held under a pressure of about 70 psi so that it will dissolve in the soda. That's about the pressure in a typical bicycle tire. That strength, that resistance to bursting, is created at the molecular level by the inflation of the preform. This bottle is made from a plastic called PET, polyethylene terephthalate. It forms very long chains of molecules called polymers, composed of atoms of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. The preform is a tangle of these long chains, but when the preform is stretched by a blast of air into a bottle, these coiled molecules become straight, which results in regions where the polymer chains align in the direction of stretch. In the side wall of the bottle, about 25% of the plastic consists of these crystalline patches. Importantly, they are lined in two directions, lengthwise, the axial direction, or along the circumference, called the hoop direction. This alignment increases the strength of the bottle. Note that this alignment with stretching to increase strength is the principal reason to choose PET for this bottle. To see how uniquely strong a plastic soda bottle is in containing that pressure, Look at how soda deforms a plastic milk jug, which is made from a different plastic, high-density polyethylene, abbreviated HDPE. As this time-lapse shows, pressure from the carbon dioxide in the soda deforms the bottom, so the jug no longer sits flat. Also, this alignment of the molecules, this crystallization of some of the bottle's wall caused by the stretching helps to overcome a deficiency of the plastic bottle compared to a glass bottle. The glass bottle is far superior to most plastics because its glass walls don't allow carbon dioxide to leak. But stretching the PET to create those crystalline sections packs the polymer chains tightly together, which decreases the leakage dramatically. Now, the plastic isn't nearly as good as glass, but it's good enough. A two liter bottle will lose about 15% of its carbonation in 26 weeks, at which point the manufacturer would declare its shelf life over, the soda no longer to be sold. Well, the type of plastic and how it's stretched is key, the shape of the container is equally important. Notice the bottle's shape at the top. It's close to hemispherical. This distributes the pressure from the dissolved carbon dioxide evenly across the wall, which allows less plastic to be used than if it had sharp edges, which would need to be thick to contain the pressure. 
This hemispherical shape was also used at the bottom of the first two-liter bottles, those from the 1970s. It was covered, though, by a cap so the bottle could sit on a table. This cap, though, was costly because it increased the time to assemble the bottle and used a lot of plastic because it was thick. Today, the solution is this petaloid bottom, petaloid meaning like a flower. It is generally hemisphere-shaped, although composed of many curves, many hemispheres, if you will, so no sharp edges. These curves form a set of legs so the bottle can rest on a surface. Next, let's look at the neck of the bottle. First, notice this lip at the base of the neck. It's there to hold the preform in the mold. Just above this is a beveled lip. This is to retain the tamper-proof ring. It's lightly attached to the cap in a few places. When you remove the cap, the tamper ring detaches to indicate the bottle's been opened. Looking inside, we see how it works. The ring has a clasp that catches on the lip. To show how it works, I've highlighted the clasp with a red marker. When the cap is first screwed on, the beveled lip presses the clasp against itself and once it slides past the lip, the clasp snaps open and catches. Next, notice the threads at the top. They're not continuous. There's a small section removed. This lets the carbon dioxide escape when the bottle is opened. Otherwise, the bottle's cap could become a projectile. The neck is the result of intensive engineering. Prior to about 2007, it was this sized. Now it's four millimeters shorter and a little thinner. And the newer cap has two threads instead of three. It takes 1.8 revolutions to affix it, whereas before it took two revolutions. Perhaps this seems trivial, but these changes shave some two grams of plastic from the bottle, which seems tiny, but over millions and millions of bottles, that small change adds up. There's no magic here. This is trial and error. They reduce the neck of it, then test thoroughly, subjecting the cap bottle to demanding tests that it must pass. No leaks can occur. Engineers attach the cap, then pressurize the bottle to 100 PSI. They heat a bottle, then place a weight on the top. To pass the test, no gas may vent. They chill the bottle, then slowly unscrew the caps to find the maximum torque needed to detach it from the tamper-proof ring. Engineers subject capped bottles to cycles of temperature. During this test, the cap must stay on the bottle. If a new neck passes all these tests and more, then it can be put into production. Now, there are many things a two-liter soda bottle can do, but here's something it doesn't do well. Fill it with hot water, and the plastic softens until the bottle nearly collapses. Yet, since its introduction as a soda bottle, the PET bottle has expanded to other beverages, which must be filled at 80 to 95 degrees Celsius to sterilize the bottles, like sports drinks, juices, or what the industry calls new age beverages. Note that a soda bottle doesn't need to be sterile because the high carbonation levels kill any bacteria. Watch as I fill a sports drink bottle, called a hot fill bottle with boiling water. Notice that the bottle doesn't collapse. The PET plastic in this bottle was heated in the mold a little longer than a bottle used for soda, which created more of those crystalline patches on the wall, and so the bottle is more resistant to heat. Still, the bottle changes shape, which is best seen in the cooling of a capped bottle. When the capped bottle cools, its volume will decrease by about 3% and creates a lower pressure in the bottle than the pressure outside the bottle, which sucks the sides in. If I zoom in on the base, you can see the recovery of the plastic during a time-lapse. You can notice this at home if you examine a large juice bottle. When it comes home from the store, its sides curve in, but when opened, they pop out when the pressure inside and out equalizes. The panels in these hot fill bottles enable this controlled contraction and expansion. These are designed to accommodate the pressure changes caused by a hot liquid cooling. The bottom of the hot fill bottle is different than a soda bottle. The graceful petaloid bottom is now replaced with a base similar to a champagne bottle. A flat outer lip and a raised center with indentations called ribs. Like the petaloid bottom, these ribs add strength, but keep the bottom generally hemispherical shaped. The implementation of these two designs, though, was delayed by a decade because of a patent dispute. Continental Can Company held patents on the hot fill base and the petaloid bottom. But Monsanto, an earlier developer of PET plastic, had patented a base a few years before Continental. 
Monsanto suggested that Continental's hot fill base was merely an obvious combination of the Monsanto patent and the petaloid bottom. This tied up all three patents. The key question addressed by the courts was this. Are the ribs in the Monsanto bottom hollow? Because clearly the indentations, the ribs in both of the Continental bottle bases, are hollow. In the courtroom, one of the inventors of the Continental hot fill bottom drew a cross-section of the ribs in that bottle and of the ribs in the petaloid bottom. He noted that these were hollow. Then he drew a cross-section of a rib from the bottle depicted in the Monsanto patent to show that they would be solid. Continental argued that hollow versus solid was the key difference, noting further that the Monsanto patent didn't use the word hollow. Monsanto countered that blow molding must create hollow ribs, which would be clear to anyone familiar with the state of the art. The first trial decided that the ribs of the Monsanto design were hollow and thus declared Continental's patent invalid. But an appeals court said in 1991, nonsense, the ribs were solid, thus restoring the validity of Continental's patent. In the early 1990s then, with the litigation over, bottles with a petaloid base and the hot fill bottom appeared on the market. These bottles were so successful that every year, some 500 billion PET bottles are manufactured. About three quarters of these bottles end up in landfills or are incinerated. The other quarter are recycled. Yet PET is among the most recyclable of plastics. It's ground into a powder, melted, then spun into fibers a fifth the diameter of a human hair, which can be woven into fabric. In 2012, the U.S. men's basketball team wore jerseys created of recycled plastic bottles, as did the 2015 Indian cricket team. And at least one high-end car manufacturer offers interiors upholstered with fabrics made from up to 100% recycled PET bottles. Thanks for listening. I'm Bill Hammack, The Engineer Guy. Okay, and then it, it'll go for a little bit, then pick this up, and a plastic soda bottle begins with this tube called a preform. Is that right? Yep. Okay. It's running, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> A plastic soda. <laughs> 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 All right. Okay, we're talking. Hey. It worked if I didn't laugh. <laughs> I was going to say, you hadn't laughed. <laughs> okay. Okay. I don't think it's in us to have a blooper section of the video. I think it, that might make it at the end.